talk a little bit about some of the uh, things I discovered researching the book. Um, hopefully we'll have time for some question and answer. Uh, and when I'm not writing books, I am speaking, I am helping companies understand data, technology, management, and I am a big fan of the show Breaking Bad. And I want to start off with a giveaway. I like to give away at least one book. Does anyone know who this is? Reed Hastings. You got a book. I'll have to save this for a different one. But Reed Hastings is the CEO and co-founder of Netflix. Now, in previous books, I've covered Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, and how they have embraced platforms and how they generate a tremendous amount of information. They're big data companies in the true sense of the word. Many companies claim that they're doing something with big data, but I would argue that very few are. Netflix, however, may be the biggest of the big data companies, but don't listen to me. Let me throw some data at you. First up, Netflix supports roughly 40 million customers, the vast majority of whom access the service via streaming. Many people don't understand that Reed Hastings, when he co-founded the company, wanted to disrupt himself. In other words, in 1997, 1998, when eBay, sorry, Netflix was essentially a DVD by mail business, why did Hastings call the company Netflix? because he understood that it was sort of silly to send you DVDs over the mail. Now remember, 15 years ago, broadband wasn't as pervasive, right? DVDs made more sense, and in fact, there's still plenty of movies on Netflix that you can only access via a DVD. Not everything is available via streaming. So Hastings understood the power of the internet, the power of data, and in this talk, I'm going to explain why. Netflix is certainly not a small company. It has a market cap of 27 billion, give or take, as of uh, today's closing. And this is my favorite Netflix stat. Netflix is responsible for nearly one third of all U.S. weeknight internet traffic. I spoke at Netflix, what's today, Tuesday, yesterday, and I screwed up. I said one fifth, not one third. I was immediately corrected by about 75 people. So it is one third. It's a tremendous statistic. And what does that mean exactly? Is that of all the data running through the pipes, all the traffic, a third comes from Netflix. The volume, yes. the megabytes. My, that's my understanding, yes. But Netflix generates a tremendous amount of data. And for this reason, Netflix is extremely concerned about something called net neutrality. And for those of you who haven't heard that, is it Comcast here, sort of the major ISP in this area of the country? So Comcast and Cox Communications started levying effectively attacks on Netflix because they consume so much data, so much volume. And guess what? You're not paying eight dollars a month for Netflix. Netflix believes that all data ought to be treated treated neutral. Here's some more facts on Netflix. It is the single biggest customer of Amazon Web Services, AWS. Show of hands if you've heard of AWS. I would assume that plenty of people here do. Now, relying on AWS is sort of a double-edged sword. Because Netflix is such a pervasive user, and Netflix uses AWS more than Amazon, when there's a problem with AWS, Netflix engineers don't just log a ticket, go, hey, this doesn't work. Sometimes they do. Many times, however, they actually tell Netflix engineers, you need to fix this line of code right here. It is X, and it needs to be Y. Relying upon AWS to the extent that it does saves Amazon billions of dollars a year in infrastructure, right? Imagine building all of these data centers, right? It would be extremely expensive employing the people to manage them. So, on one hand, Netflix is able to manage its costs. The downside, though, is what happens when Netflix goes down. Who remembers December of 2012? Okay? And Netflix fail started trending on Twitter because Netflix was down. In reality, the problem had nothing to do with Netflix. It had everything to do with AWS. But most people don't understand the distinction. So what happens when Netflix is down on Christmas Day? You have to talk to your families. You can't watch your favorite TV shows, and we can't have any of that. So people started screaming on Twitter about Netflix failing. But Netflix is really a disruptive company. I mentioned before that they intended initially to disrupt themselves. They're also disrupting Hollywood. And in September of 2013, Netflix became the first non-TV network to win an Emmy or House of Cards. Netflix has ventured into original programming, House of Cards, Lily Hammer, Orange is the New Black. They brought back one of my favorite shows, Arrested Development. Any Arrested Development fans out here? Okay, only one. Netflix is also allowing plenty of people to either cut the cord with their cable companies, or if you remember the term cord members, there are about five million people 
who use Hulu, who use Netflix, who use YouTube, they would never dream of paying $150 a month to a cable company. So Netflix is an inherently disruptive company. And through this talk, I'm going to show you how they use data in ways that actually mitigate a great deal of the risk and let them understand their customers better than perhaps any company out there, maybe with the exception of Amazon. And a short while after starting to research the book, I came across a very fascinating credo at Netflix. And it's about the way they use data. Many companies espouse the virtues of big data. There's an interesting Gartner stat that I read that 64% of companies are undertaking some type of big data initiative. That may very well be in terms of setting up a dupe environment to play around with test data, but how many companies are actually using petabytes of unstructured data to make better business decisions, to understand their customers? I would argue very few. And in Netflix, these aren't just hollow words. This three-part data credo starts with data should be accessible, easy to discover, and is it a process for everyone? Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that everyone has access to the same information that someone like Reed Hastings does. But Netflix is a very democratic organization vis-a-vis -vis data. Netflix is tracking when customers are clicking to watch, when they stop, when they pause, what they're watching. And they're doing some really interesting things with just the data that they collect on their customers. But it gets even better. Netflix isn't content with just the data that it generates, or its customers, I should say, generate that it stores. Netflix actually purchases a great deal of third-party data and metadata from companies like Nielsen, which is a global information um, and measurement company. Netflix wants more data on what people are watching, what people are buying. So think about those two things. It generates a tremendous amount of data, one-third of all U.S. Uh, nighttime internet traffic, traffic during the weekdays, and it buys even more. After the book came out, I became aware of an Atlantic article about how Netflix does even more than that. It never has enough data. It has an endless appetite for data. Netflix understands that computers and algorithms can only get you so far. Right? There are things in movies that we just can't really quantify. Right? And I found out that Netflix pays people to watch movies. Now, this isn't simply a matter of going to admit, why don't you watch this and tell me what you think. They train people on how to watch movies. They want very specific ratings. How suspenseful is this movie? They give you a scale. They're trying to minimize, if not eliminate, the subjectivity. And they're looking at the things that are taking place in movies. Because of that, Netflix can go beyond simply grouping genres of movies like comedies. This is Arrested Development which is an orange cover, and I'm going to come back to that. So comedies, that's pretty broad. Dramas, again, pretty broad. Westerns, docu documentaries, right? Those are very broad categories. Netflix, as I'm going to show you, goes a great deal deeper. In another article that came out after the book was published, Technology Moves Very Quickly, I come to terms with the fact that I can put out a book and two weeks later, point of it isn't true. That's why I try to write about trends in management as opposed to what does this version of Hadoop do. Netflix can actually break its movies into subgenres. And a guy from the Atlantic did some research and determined that Netflix had essentially broken its movies into 77,000 different subgenres. And that number keeps growing. That's a big number, and it's a little abstract. So here are a few examples. At Netflix, certain movies fall into dark, suspenseful, sci-fi horror movies. Okay? Pretty specific. Gritty, suspenseful, revenge westerns. I guess there are gritty, suspenseful, non-revenge westerns. There are also romantic Indian crime dramas. I can't name any, but evidently they exist. Not to be confused with evil kid horror movies. Then there are the visually striking, goofy action and adventure films. And then finally, violent, suspenseful action and adventure movies from the 90, uh, 1980s. Netflix can be extremely granular in the way that it not only classifies what movies people are watching, but also in the way that it tries to predict what you're going to watch. And remember, this is a key point here. Does anyone here not have a smartphone? 
Most of you have what, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and what do they do? They lock you into a two-year contract, right? If you want to leave, you can, but you have to pay, right? What does Netflix do? Are you locked into any long-term contract? None that I'm aware of. It's like Salesforce.com. You essentially pay for as long as you want it. Netflix is thinking you will continue to want it as long as we can keep it interesting for you. And the best way to do that is to use data to recommend things to you that maybe you hadn't thought about. Again, plenty of people will look at a comedy and go, I don't like all comedies. Does anyone here like every particular movie within a genre? Probably not. So Netflix understands the value of information. The second part of this credo is that the longer you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. That's pretty hard to dispute, and many companies at a high level, I believe, would agree with that. But Netflix actually walks the talk. <coughs> Things can happen very quickly. The question to me is how fast can a company respond? Netflix can respond extremely quickly. Here's the other book giveaway question. This is my fail safe. Does anyone know who this is? Brian Cranston. Oh, sorry. If you <laughs> raised your hand and you said Brian Cranston. <laughs> so here's what I will do. I will give you the book and you can do uh, rock, scissors, paper. Uh, but yes, this is Brian Cranston. Yeah, you can figure it out. You can even <laughs> split the book in two. You get the first four chapters. And... Well, the book is too bad you did it. <laughs> it did do a good job in the design. But happy maybe. Do do that. One of you read it and give it to the other person. Anyway, this is Brian Cranston, and he plays Walter White on the show Breaking Bad. There's a, if anyone doesn't know the premise of the show, I'll give it to you in about a minute. Brian Cranston's character, Walter White, is a 50-year-old high school chemistry teacher with a pregnant wife and a teenage son with cerebral palsy. He doesn't make very much money as a high school chemistry teacher, so he has to work in a car wash. And one day, he's diagnosed with terminal lung cancer and six months to live. Because he does not want to leave his family with a burden of a lot of debt, he starts doing what any desperate high school chemistry teacher would do. He starts manufacturing crystal meth. The show is very addictive. And many people engage in what they call binge watching. In other words, because Netflix lets you stream as much as you want, you can watch as much as you want. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet. And many people will say, you know, I was able to watch 20 consecutive hours of House of Cards or Breaking Bad. There's nobody stopping you. One of the questions that they asked Hastings about Breaking Bad is how many people actually watch this? Now that's sort of a, a broad question. Netflix knew that the day before season five premiered, 50,000 subscribers watched all 13 episodes the day before. So each episode is about 45 minutes, 13 hours, about 10 hours of viewing. Now some people laugh and think you guys must be crazy, and maybe we are. But I dare you to watch the first five minutes of the first episode of Breaking Bad and not want to watch at least a little bit more. This isn't just with Breaking Bad. Ted Sarandos is the chief content officer at Netflix. Now, in many companies, there's been this title inflation, right? Chief innovation officer, chief data officer. Sometimes those titles mean something. I would argue sometimes they don't. At Netflix, if you're chief content officer, it's a big deal. Because if you look at Netflix's financials, the company spends billions of dollars every year on content acquisition. Not just for original programs, like Orange is the New Black or House of Cards, but for the rights to break into that or the rights to other shows. And when they asked Ted Sarandos, are you afraid that you're spending $100 million on 13 episodes of House of Cards? Can't people just pay $8 and binge watch and never come back, or come back a year later when you do season two? I found Sarandos' answer fascinating. He did not say, we don't know, we don't think it'll happen, we hope that it doesn't happen. He said only 8,000 people did. So they know exactly what their customers are doing. Now, 8,000 customers is a significant number. But divide that by 40 million, and it's a rounding number. So Netflix knows exactly what its customers are doing. The third part of the Netflix data credo I want to focus on today, and that's whether a data set is large or small, being able to visualize it, makes it easier to explain. This isn't a company that thinks abstractly or theoretically about data. This is a company that uses and creates new tools to understand types of data. 
that may or may not be driving their customers' decisions. Does anyone recognize this guy? Kevin Spacey, right, from House of Cards. These are four of my very favorite Kevin Spacey films. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, one of my top five. The Usual Suspects, he won Best Supporting Actor. John Doe, he played in Seven, a movie about a serial killer, Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman. And then finally, his Oscar-winning performance as lead actor, Lester Burnham in American Beauty. Amazing movies. Now, Spacey's current project is House of Cards. And as I mentioned before, Netflix spent $100 million on 13 episodes of House of Cards. Most times when you pitch a series in Hollywood, I've been told, you have to produce a pilot. People want a proof of concept. Are people going to like this show? Netflix didn't require one. They didn't ask for one because they knew Kevin Spacey was popular. But beyond that, Netflix had the data to justify that decision. That did not mean that there wasn't risk involved in that decision. Of course there was risk but they had the data to make it a, a tolerable, a manageable risk. Netflix bought 13 episodes, essentially sight unseen. And they knew that, for example, when David Fincher from Seven and Fight Club directed the first two episodes, that they could market that fact to people who liked Fight Club and the other David Fincher movies like Seven. Netflix did market House of Cards the same to different types of people. If you're a Kevin Spacey fan like I am, you would see a video that besides Kevin Spacey, but let's say you like Robin Wright Penn, who's also in House of Cards. Maybe you're a Forrest Gump fan. Maybe you're really not into violent suspense or movies from the 90s. Netflix could market the same movie to different customers in very different ways. This is the cover of House of Cards. And I want to point this out because Netflix does something absolutely fascinating with the data from this cover. Now, on the show, for those who don't know, House of Cards is based on a BBC series. Netflix bought the rights to it. And Kevin Spacey plays Frank Underhill, who I believe is Secretary of State in season one. He's up there in the government. And here in this position, he looks very authoritative, very presidential. And he's a white guy about 50 years old. This cover is actually very similar to the PBS series with Patrick Stewart for Macbeth. Patrick Stewart's a few years older. Like me, he doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of hair. And there's a lot of black there. Both are white guys, same age. Right? Now, Netflix asked the question, how similar are these colors? And this wasn't just a matter of saying, one's black and the other's black. A couple of white guys. Netflix broke down the extent to which these movie titles, the imagery, were similar. Right? So we know exactly how black, what HTML colors, how turquoise, how gray. And Netflix didn't do this with just two movies as a one-off experiment. Netflix can do this with any movies or any TV shows. Hemlock Grove is another Netflix series, original. I mentioned before, Rest Development, that's very orange. So we can see that there are even maybe some similarities among ostensibly different movies and their colors. And I can't prove this because, like a lot of companies, Netflix keeps a great deal of what it does close to the vest. And I would probably do the same. But I guarantee you that at some point, someone when designing the cover for House of Cards said, how do we want this to look? In fact, I read an article about a year ago about how big data could actually not eliminate creativity, but potentially compromise it. Because this wasn't just the designer's conception of how it should look. That might have been the starting point. But what if you have the data to say, you know what, we should make this black. It's arguably making a better business decision. So Netflix knows a great deal about its customers, not just what they watch. Okay? If you think about this, that even going back 15 years when Netflix was founded, they send you DVDs. They have to know what you're ordering, right? That doesn't mean that mistakes weren't made particularly early on. But in general, they know what's on your queue and what they were sending you if you go back. Well now, because of streaming, Netflix can go a great deal beyond what you watch. There was no way in the DVD by mail business to know when you were watching. There wasn't a little sensor on the DVD that didn't install cameras in your houses. But now, if you're streaming, Netflix knows when you're watching. And think about that. From that simple fact, Netflix can make potentially inferences about your household. If you're watching, say, at 10 o'clock in the morning, 
children's movies, it's possible that you have children. If at 10 to 12 in the morning, if you're watching horror movies, you might have children, but which do you think would be more likely to have kids? If you're a 40-year-old guy, you're probably not watching children's movies. Netflix also knows the device on which you're watching. If you go back, even five, six years ago, right, before the explosion of smartphones like the iPhone and the tablets and the ability for Xboxes and Playstations to play DVDs or to stream, it's a lot more complicated now. You're not just watching from your DVD player or from your computer. And as I mentioned before, Netflix knows when you're pausing and when you resume. Maybe there's a point at which certain types of people tune out to a movie and never come back. Right? If you pause for 30 seconds, maybe it's because the phone rang. If you pause for 30 days, maybe you just didn't like the movie. So what? Right? In this era of big data, there are plenty of companies that aggregate a lot of information. But as I argue in this book, success hinges upon what you do with the information. Right? And I find that there are very few companies that actually take what we call big data and do something with it. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But I was thinking about questions like this. How do we make sense of all this big data? My previous book is called Too Big to Ignore, the Business Case for Big Data. It's Big Data 101. It covers why it's happening, what is big data, the difference between structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data, what is a dupe, et cetera, et cetera. But in one of the chapters of that book, I talk about data bits. I do it in a very quick way because data is in and of itself could be a fairly lengthy book. I saw a great blog post a couple weeks ago that data is was the front end of what we call big data. I thought that was actually really fascinating because as we talked about over lunch, most business users don't know how to set up a dupe. But you want to create the tools and employ the tools that let people ask questions to interact with the data without having to be a hardcore program. I was wondering about how progressive companies like eBay, like Netflix, are turning this data into actual insights. Can they predict? Some of you may have seen this, but a couple months ago, Amazon quietly, before it became public, filed a patent for anticipatory commerce, which is just a fancy way of saying, we think we're going to know what you want to order before you order it. Or, at a minimum, we could put the stock in a warehouse, which is a couple hours away, such that when you order something, they could do same-day delivery. Think about it. Forget just being able to understand what your customers actually are doing. Think about being able to predict what they may want to do, what they may want to buy. Did anyone see the 60 Minutes piece on Jeff Bezos with the drones? Most people saw it. It was the, the Sunday night before Cyber Monday. For those of you who didn't see it, in the near future, according to Bezos, there will be drones that can make deliveries. Now, my favorite part of that whole piece was when they asked Bezos, could this work? He said yes, because the drones can handle up to five pounds, and 62% of our orders are five pounds or under. Just knew that information. What can we learn from these types of companies? In the book, I argue that you don't need to be a company the size of Netflix, the size of eBay, to visualize, to learn things from your data. But when you think about it, data and data this aren't just taking place inside of corporate America, inside of the workplace. I argue that data and data this are actually everywhere. Not just inside organizations. Right? Yes, employees are more visual, but employees are also consumers. I'm going to show you an example of what I'm talking about a bit. Has anyone been to data.gov and played around a little bit? Okay, a few people. Government. So the United States government is making an increasing amount of data available, open data, link data, and people are creating some really interesting data visualizations. I saw one on BART and tweets during time of day, which I thought was really interesting. As expected, if people are riding the trains or the bus at 5 o'clock coming home from work, they might be more likely to tweet. Citizens are becoming more visual, and this is certainly true, I think, if you look at the millennials. I've met many smart people who can do things with data that 20 years ago people just couldn't do. We're also seeing the rise of visual and data-driven journalists like Nate Silver. I'll talk about him in a little bit. And then finally, a more visual athlete 
Has anyone ever read the book or seen the movie Moneyball? Okay, a few people. This isn't just baseball, basketball, football, hockey, golf, tennis. We're seeing all sorts of different analytics applied to different sports. And this is even being up as people are having sensors put in. The NFL has a massive concussion problem. Historically, it hasn't been easy to determine if someone got his bell rung. Well, now if there's a sensor, companies are working on technologies that can assess maybe just one hit puts you in a danger zone. So they're doing some really interesting things right now. About nine months ago, I was keynoting in Manhattan on a conference for big data and healthcare. And I walked down the street, going to my event, and I stopped because I saw this. This is a dry cleaner that took its Yelp reviews and created a very simple bar graph. This isn't high tech, no disrespect intended to dry cleaners. This is a simple <coughs> chart. But if this dry cleaner had put, we're the best dry cleaner, our customers love us, they think I would have stopped to take that picture. So data and data viz, I would argue, are everywhere. And I went to Yelp just for giggles to see, as a merchant, and I'm not a merchant on Yelp, but if this information is available, what's available to me as a user? Because 99% of the content, I would imagine, on Yelp is generated from people like you and me. Right? If you take away Yelp's data, what value does it have? Okay. Like Facebook, I would argue not very much. And I looked at some of my reviews on Yelp, and this is a very simple database of where I review. Now, I live in Las Vegas, and I have for the last two and a half years, but I used to live in West Caldwell, New Jersey, where they filmed The Sopranos. But I visited Portland, and I spoke in Toronto, and I've been up to Seattle. So this, I thought, was an interesting way of just pre presenting a simple pie chart on how I review things. But this is just one of many ways you can cut the data. One click later and bang, I can see here how I break down my reviews. I tend to review a decent number of restaurants. And that makes sense to me, right? Because typically I have either a good experience and want to tell someone, or I have a bad experience and want to tell someone. I haven't seen the data, but I'm sure they're asking this at Yelp. I would imagine that not too many people take the time to post a three-star review. Right? In fact, a couple of months ago, Yelp changed its policy. For a long time, you could not write a mobile review. Why? Because the merchants wouldn't like it if you were waiting online for 10 minutes and go, oh, this restaurant isn't very good, one star. They wanted you to go home and think about it. But eventually, enough of the users said, we want to be able to generate data. And Yelp said, all right, we're going to agree. Does anyone know who this is? Not a lot of basketball fans, huh? Ray Allen. Ray Allen, very good. If you order some books, he gets one. <laughs> Ray Allen is the all-time leading NBA three-point shooter. He is currently the backup two-guard, shooting guard for the Miami Heat. He sometimes starts when Dwayne Wade is injured, which unfortunately is quite a bit these days. Anyway, Ray Allen is a very efficient shooter, and if you look at his percentage, he's in his career made about 39% of the three-pointers he's tried. But, believe it or not, the NBA three-point line is fairly long. He doesn't shoot the same percentage at the same points. In fact, on the corners, it's actually, not to get into geometry here, but it's actually closer to the basket on the sides. It's not a coincidence that Ray Allen takes a lot of shots where the right circles are, where the red is. Now think about this just in terms of probability. Inside the arc, you make two points. And if you're open for a layup, you're not going to run back to the three-point line unless you're down by three, et cetera, et cetera. But it really doesn't make sense for Ray Allen to take an 18-foot two-point shot, right? If he moves back two feet, it's a three-point shot. Now, he has a smaller chance of making that, a lower chance, but the payoff's 50% higher. We are seeing now many different sports teams apply these types of analytics. This isn't simply about, yeah, we think he's pretty good. There's a great statistic that I read in a book recently, Scorecasting. And I'm not a huge basketball fan, but I like to watch it. And they broke down Dwight Howard's blocks, who now plays for the Rockets, with Tim Duncan's blocks, who's played his entire career with the Spurs. Tim Duncan has fewer blocks than Dwight Howard, but they broke down the blocks because not all blocks are created equal. If a mitt takes a shot and I block it out of bounds, you get the ball back, right? So really, what have I accomplished? Maybe I scared you from taking it to the hole against me. But what if I block it to my teammate? You don't get the ball back. 
even though Dwight Howard had more blocks, Tim Duncan's blocks were more valuable. Okay? I found that fascinating. Does anyone know who this is? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Who saw 60 Minutes last Sunday in the profile? Mm -hmm. On the way over here, I came from San Francisco. I passed the test. Was it the main Tesla factory on 101? Well, oh, that was kind of neat. Yeah. It's not the main one, it's one of the ones? Okay. Good to know. Musk, in early 2013, with the new model of the Tesla, made some claims about the car's battery life, the car's performance. And there were some fairly lofty claims. John Broder, a New York Times journalist, decided to test those claims. And he very diligently, according to him, went out and documented them. Where he drove, how many miles, how fast, where he charged. He created a lot. He generated data. And guess what? That data did not jive with Musk's claims about Tesla's performance. Now, if John Broder were a 12 year old on Tumblr, who cares? But he's not. Broder is a New York Times journalist. They have pretty good SEO. That review is going to stick. This is the first time I can recall that a CEO and a journalist were arguing about a data. The times in which we're living blow my mind. When the prison scandal broke and the government said we weren't collecting data on phone calls, we were just collecting the metadata. In other words, the time of the call, the duration, the GPS coordinates. Did anyone ever think that President Obama would utter the words metadata? I did not. So we're living in this time of massive data. Yet, as I looked at the current landscape, I'm a big believer in the value of case studies. I did not see a lot of vendor neutral case studies around data visualization. Yes, other books have been written about data visualization. Edward Tufte, Stephen Few, Nathan Yao. But they were more theoretical. This is how you should create a floral plot. This is the best way to do a stacked uh, pie chart. I did see a lot of companies out there researched, again, in a vendor neutral way, of what companies were actually doing. Where are all the case studies? I'm a geek, so what did I do? I Googled it, and I found that there were only 23, in quotes, case studies according to Google with data visualization as of August 31st, 2013. Now, of those results, a couple were my own blog posts going, where are all the data viz case studies? Contrast that with ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning. There were thousands of case studies. What about CRM? There were even more case studies. So I did see a great deal of work done about what companies were actually doing. And that's what I really um, strove to provide in this book. And soon after I started my research, I came across a really fascinating example of data viz from Autodesk. An employee there up in Canada by the name of Justin Majeka created something called an org org chart, organic organization chart. And I simplified it a bit, but think about it. Employees move within large organizations, and Autodesk now supports around 7,000 employees. On any given day, someone is being hired, someone is being fired, someone's being demoted, someone's being transferred. A whole department may be shifted on the org chart. In over four years, Majeka put together a great deal of employee information. And he created this stunning database. At the center is not space. At the center here is the CEO. The closer you are to the CEO, in theory, the higher you up, up you are on a theoretical org chart. This tool will let you pause it, you can rewind it, you can go backward. And to me, this tool raises a lot of questions. And in the book, I've got some screenshots of it, but the screenshots don't do justice to the actual tool. If you want, you can check this out on YouTube, it's Board or Chart. Okay. It is fascinating to me that this doesn't necessarily tell you that there's a problem in organization X, but why are things happening? You know, on the left here, what's going on with this? It promotes other questions. In the book, I argue that an interactive tool allows you to have a conversation with the data to ask it questions. Ultimately, you may find your answer, but in many instances, the answer isn't terribly obvious. You may need to ask better questions. Now, I've spoken a lot about Netflix and Autodesk, two companies that have thousands of employees, billions of dollars, which begs the question, do you need to be that kind of organization in size 
to sort of embrace the concepts that I discuss in the book? And the answer is no. Uh, there's a six-person social polling startup in Las Vegas called Wedgies. And they're a lot of fun. Uh, you, you can create a poll through Twitter in about 30 seconds. The poll typically has a featured image. It's not required, but if it's sticky, it has an image, it has a better chance of getting votes, which is really the whole point. And I created some wedgies just for giggles, uh, one of which was, um, who is the more disgraced New York politician, Anthony Weiner, who had some fun on Twitter, and Elliot Spitzer, who had an incident with a caller. And I just threw out a poll. Weiner won, by the way, in case you're curious. Very unscientific, but it was curious. So on the front end, with the wedgie, you can put in an image, right? But that's not terribly difficult to do. On the back end, this six-person company uses Google Analytics, has used the D3, which is an open source tool that I believe you use here at eBay in certain departments, and it's created a very visual front end. Again, in a six-person company, if something goes viral, like it's a NASCAR poll that happened, and they run on AWS, well, think about it. You may need to up your provision. So net, uh, Wedgies understands this notion of being visual. It has created its infrastructure in such a way that if it goes from six people to 60 to 600 to 6,000, its architecture is really sound. Now, I also in the book discuss the University of Texas, and without getting myself in too much trouble here, in academia sometimes it's not the most progressive place. Right? Many times say, well, we don't do it that way. University of Texas use SAS visual analytics to put a tremendous amount of data out there, not just for its employees, not just for alumni, but for anyone with an internet connection. You can go to the University of Texas productivity dashboard and drill around and play with data in an interactive way. And if you want to see what are admission rates for the PhD program in engineering, you can. What if you want to cut that by demographic? You can ask all these sorts of questions with data. And I specifically chose different types of organizations because the danger in writing a book like this and focusing on Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Netflix, eBay, is that most companies don't have nearly the same human and the same financial resources. The point here is that you don't necessarily go from zero to Google overnight. Google, Amazon, Apple can do things now that they couldn't do five years ago. Same with eBay. And in five years, you'll be able to do things that you couldn't do five to today. Visual organizations very much eschew this notion of set it and forget it. In 2004, I went to a utility company in New Jersey. And we were implementing an HR payroll solution, financials ERP. And I had to build a Microsoft Access database that would extract data from one part of the system, noodle with it, and import it back into the system, AKA an ETL tool. I built the tool and it worked. Five years later, I get a phone call. Hey, Phil, we're going through a major system upgrade. Can you come down? Rate was fine. I lived in New Jersey. Not a problem. I'm there. I walk in. And it was five years, but I recognized the place. And I saw a woman, and she looked really familiar. And then I looked at her computer, and she had a really nice-looking Microsoft Access database up. And I said to her, gosh, you have really great design tastes. And she goes, you don't remember me, do you? I say, you know, it's been a while. I'm sorry. Why did I design it? She said, yes. And I asked her two questions. A, have you tweaked it? Answer, no. B, does it still work? Answer, yes. C, number one. There's nothing wrong with that. I did my job. That's what I was supposed to do. But to think that the world doesn't change in this era of big data, I think, is just silly. That doesn't mean that you always have to blow up tools. But why not look at new data sources? Around five years ago, four years ago, companies started to get their arms around social data, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. And all of a sudden, two years ago, Pinterest becomes a big deal. And there are a lot of people who said, oh, well, this never ends. It's like whack-a-mole, right? I'm never finished. How do I know that Pinterest data matters? In point of fact, it might not. But what if it does? And in reality, if you look at Pinterest's engagement numbers, they're pretty insane. These companies encourage data exploration and discovery. At Netflix, there's no way that someone said, I want to quantify the colors on the cover imagery. And someone said, okay, you can do it, but only the ROI is 8.5% or higher. There's absolutely no way that conversation took place inside of Netflix. It was worth pursuing, even if it ultimately failed. These companies recognize the limitations of traditional reporting stalwarts. I've written thousands of reports for my clients in my career. Typically, they needed me to write a report that pulled data from a system. 
That wasn't hard to do, but that report for the most part had one purpose. Yes, I knew how to create dynamic prompts and export options, and one report could really be five reports, but for the most part, you were asking a finite question. That's different than true data discovery. These reporting stalwarts have limitations. KPIs and dashboards and standard reports, they're still important. You're still going to look at a P&L, you're in payroll, you're still gonna look at a payroll register. But I would argue that those tools don't really encourage asking different types of questions to the extent that some of the tools that I discussed in the book do. And these companies will buy and build new tools as necessary. Netflix didn't go to the store and go, we'll take the uh, movie color software, please. They built it because they thought it would be useful. That doesn't mean that you have to have every tool, but sometimes the old tools don't do well with new types of data. Right? Why is the dupe so important? Why is it so prevalent in some of these companies here in Silicon Valley? Well, try writing an SQL statement against 20 petabytes of unstructured data. Probably not going to work very quickly. But there are many myths, I think, that prohibit organizations or even departments within organization from doing more with data this. One of which is that we have to have all the data. I think that's complete nonsense. You're never going to have all the data. I did a tech cocktail interview a couple weeks ago on the book, and the last question was, what do you do with data this? My answer was, not as much as I would like. At lunch, we were talking about Amazon. Amazon makes tools available to authors, one of which is what they call Author Central. And Amazon will give all authors a heat map. And it's somewhat interactive. I don't know who bought my books, but I know where. So in Seattle, in San Francisco, in Washington, D.C., I tend to sell a lot of books, but I don't know that a mint bought 10 copies. Because if I did, I could contact the mint and say, hey, mint, I have a new book coming out. Forget Amazon, let me just sell it to you. Why would Amazon take itself out of the equation? It wouldn't. On the basis of that, I can tweak my Google AdWords. Maybe I'll pay more for a click on Big Data Speaker or Data This Speaker in Seattle because that's where I sell a lot of books. There seems to be demand there. I'm not just guessing, oh sure, I'll pay the same in Alabama as I do in San Francisco. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I realize that I'm never going to have all the data as much as I would like it. Next up, many companies only visualize good data, which I think is a massive mistake. But we don't want to do anything because we have data quality issues. I understand that you may not make a decision based on really faulty data, regardless of what tool you're using. But I would also argue that one of the best ways to see if you've got bad data is to visualize it. This isn't a book on neuroscience, but in researching the topic, I came across a stat that I thought was bewildering. We recognize data in a visual form, something like 60 to 60,000 times faster, depending on the brain and depending upon the data. But just because we visualize it doesn't mean that will always manifest the right decision or the right action. When I read that book, the EQI, the Visual Display of Quantitative Information when I was 19 at Carnegie Mellon, I was amazed at how simply manipulating the x-axis and the y-axis could give you a completely different story. Right? You want to make a stock that's volatile look stable? Not hard to do. You want to reverse that? Absolutely not hard to do. What's more, even the choice of colors subtly influence the way we view data. There's a great book I read recently called Drunk Tank Pink. And it's a true story. They used to paint in the 50s and the 60s in football, high school football um, stadiums, the opposing locker room walls pink. Very specific shape. Because psychologically, that would screw with people. Right? That wasn't it by accident. So design has a huge impact on this. There's also this myth that visualization leads to certainty. I would argue that there's never certainty. Even Netflix, which does big data just about as well as anyone, was not certain that it's bet on how the cards would pay off. It didn't know it was going to win any. It didn't know that it would increase its brand value, that it would increase its customer base. So there is no such thing as certainty in this era of big data. As for lessons, first of all, user experience really matters. We were talking at lunch about, I think, the real danger of developing something in a vacuum waterfall method, and then, okay, we have it, here you go to people, hopefully it works, nice to see, right? I think there's a great deal to be said for involving people early in the process. Remember, hopefully the business users are the ones actually doing something with this. I would argue that visualization should not be the exclusive purview of IT. Next up, experimentation is paramount. We don't know if these tools are necessarily going to be useful, and in many, I think, rigid organizations, people are so afraid of failure that they won't put anything out there. Um, 
there will be failures with data bits and design. Maybe something had good data, but the design wasn't. I mean, it's an iteration. When I talked to uh, Justin Majega about Autodesk and that cool visual you just saw, I said, there's no way this was the first bite of the apple. He said, no, this had a bunch of different treatments before we got something that people thought they could actually use. It's also before, important, as I said before, to walk before you can run. You know, a company like eBay has been doing this for a long time, Netflix, Google, Amazon. You don't get to that point overnight. But it's also important, I would argue, not to be complacent. Many organizations, and my understanding of eBay is that you're not one of them, I believe, suffer from what I would call a quarterly visualization mentality. We only visualize our data for a quarterly report or for our annual meeting. I think that's nonsense. In this era of big data, when we can quantify more and more things, being able to have a conversation, being able to ask the data questions and refine those questions, I think should be a daily type of thing. University of Texas, I mentioned, is really leading when it comes to making data more transparent. In 1972, Stuart Brand said information wants to be free. I think that's really playing out today. Next up, again, all data is not required to begin. And then finally, it's important, as I said before, to iterate. Um, what you're building now may not be the same as what you wind up using six months or a year from now. That's all I have. Here's how you connect with me, and we have time for some questions. Yes? Um, can you talk about um, interactive versus static visualizations, and in particular, visualizations that motion, um, so time series things. Okay. As a general rule, I argue in the book that, that there's a, a framework that I put forth, I think in chapter in six, about how I talk about visualization more as a binary. Right? In other words, you are or you're not. In reality, it's not that simple. I lay out sort of four types or four levels of visualization. If, you're, if you just visualize small data in a static way, and it, like that Yelp data of his um, dry cleaner one, there's value in that. But there's only so much I believe you can get out of that. When you start to get to what I call level four, you're not just taking the small data, the structured type, you're taking the big data, the unstructured type, and you're not just using static tools, you're using interactive tools, and you're doing things like motion. Uh, this is not a book about how to do something. I, I thought that, that book had been written before. It does seem like there are more and more of those types of things that are out there. I would say this, though, when I was at Autodesk, I had a really good question. He said, doesn't this kind of get into art? And I said, it does. Because some of the data is beautiful. David McCann has, uh, has written a couple books about, uh, he's got a TED talk called Information is Beautiful. But just because something is beautiful, it doesn't mean that it's useful. Um, I've seen some cool things, and then I've looked at them and said, well, what does that necessarily teach me? So I would say in general, if you want it to be useful and cool, hopefully you can have both. But I think that if it's just useful and ugly, it maybe wouldn't catch on as much as something that was useful and pretty. But give me useful over pretty and not useful any day of the week and twice on Sunday. But there's no shortage of really cool time series. And, uh, or, or there was a Twitter one on my um, new article just hit wired. And that was the one I started talking about before. But it's on my Twitter stream at, at Phil Simon. <laughs> following. Um, you can see that out there, and a guy by the name of Santiago Ortiz in Spain visualized a bunch of Twitter data. Twitter had kept a list public of 1,250 employees. They since took it down because that they were afraid that the employees would be poached. Understandable. Anyway, he scrapes 100,000 tweets over a one-week period, and he was able to see how those networks, how those groups, those employees were communicating, those departments. He also saw that there were two recent Twitter acquisitions. But they, for that, for that week alone, they were just talking to each other. They weren't talking with the, uh, the rest of the company, HR, marketing, administration, whatever. So with those types of tools, you can actually, I would argue, see things that you wouldn't have been able to see. There's another cool company I mentioned in the book called Ayazdi, which is Cherokee for to seek. And they did this retroactively. So take this with some salt, but it's pretty cool. Remember Enron? Right? For those of you who don't know, Enron was a uh, energy companies, or fortune being the most innovative company in America six consecutive years. At one point, they claimed to have done $100 billion in sales a year, except that it was a fraud, and it wound up exploding. And because of that, we were talking to lunch over about Sarbanes-Oxley. You can basically blame the guys at Enron, although they weren't the only people. Anyway, Ayazdi purchased a 
database with 10,000 emails from Enron executives. And they were able to run their algorithm against it and visualize actual patterns. And you would see the red uh, drew a flat. And they were using, I think a part of it was natural language, language processing, NLP, and looking at the words within those emails and the frequency to go, wait a minute, there's a problem here. There's no reason that you couldn't apply that type of thing to email, which is largely, depending on your definition, semi-structured or unstructured. Aside from the all sorts of analytics you can do on who's emailing whom, when you think about what Facebook's doing with what they call the social graph, there are all sorts of relationships you can see with these new tools that I would argue you don't write SQL statements to see in the same way. So I think the potential is great, but I'm unaware of too many companies that at least would talk to me for it. And in the book, I, again, I wanted to focus more on practice and less on theory. Other questions? Well, if no one has any questions, thank you for attending, and I will hang up for a few if anyone wants to talk to me one on one. But again, uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.